The light of the world is our theme this morning. This world leads, needs light, doesn't it? Let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you recognizing that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The world is dark. It's a sinful place. It's a wicked place. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ being the light of the world. Not only the light in the past as he came, not only the light through his presence in the lives of believers, Lord, but he is also the light for the kingdom one day. And Lord, we long for that day in which Jesus returns and he will reign. We look forward to that day. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ being the light of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Jesus, the light of the world. I brought along a light that we carry uh, with us when we go on our adventure kids' hikes on Sunday nights. So all the kids in the room, you'll recognize this this little lantern here. And uh, to more accurately illustrate uh, today's worship theme, I'm going to ask the AVL booth to turn off all the lights in the room. So go ahead. Thank you. Whoa, it's kind of dark in here. Uh, notice a couple things. One, we all see the light. You can see it here. You see this light. And two, I am seeing by the light so I can read my notes. When we do our Adventure Kids hikes on Sunday nights, you can see the line of lights. Actually, it's one of my favorite parts of the Sunday nights is I see this line of lights walking down the trail. It's pretty cool. And so we see the lights, but we also see that those who are walking the trail, myself included, we can see the trail by those lights. We can see the rocks, the cactus, those thorny desert trees. The lights help us stay on the trail as we make our way up to the campfire on the hill. We see the light and we see by the light. Our theme today, we see Jesus the light and we see our way by the light. When Jesus said in John chapter 9, I am the light of the world, that statement was made in the middle of Jesus giving sight to a blind man. Jesus was not only the light, but he gave light, so to speak, to the blind man. In this dark, dark world, represented by this dark room, Jesus is the light, and he is the only way that we can see our way. I think about that person without the light left to the notions of his own feelings and reasonings, the ever-changing whims of, and dangers of this world that we live in, as that unsaved person attempts to navigate the path of life without Jesus, the light of the world, he most definitely will wander off into trouble. He has no understanding, no illumination. Aren't you thankful today for our shining light, Jesus, And aren't you thankful that he shines his light on the path of our lives, showing us how to navigate through this dark and treacherous world? May we share this light, Jesus, to those in darkness, and may we worship him, appreciate him, Jesus, the light of the world. Oh, oh, oh. 
Amen. The light of the world is Jesus. One of my favorite Advent verses is from uh, Luke. In the beginning of Luke, I believe it's chapter 1, when uh, Zacharias says, when he's about to have John the Baptist, or John the Baptist was just born, but he says about Jesus that the day spring from on high has arrived. There's a whole Christian greeting card company named after that verse, day spring. But do you know what the word day spring means? It simply means sunrise. That when Jesus came, it was like the sun was rising, the first light of dawn. He is the light of the world. Let's stand together and we'll sing Joy Has Dawned. Usually a Christmas hymn, but appropriate for this morning, Joy Has Dawned. darkness see the light of life has come phrase from the next hymn that we'll sing come behold look see the wondrous mystery jesus the light of the world has come let's sing together come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the king be the theme of heaven's praises robed in frail
Christ in power resurrected as he will be when he comes. Lastly, we'll sing together this morning, Open Our Eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. If we know him as Savior, our eyes have been opened. Yet we need them, in a sense, again, opened over and over. We want to see Jesus. We want to see the light of the world. See him from his word this morning in just a moment. So sing this as a prayer. Open our eyes, Lord. Sing together as a prayer. We want to see Jesus. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Please remain standing as God's word is read. John chapter 1 is our scripture reading this morning, beginning in verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without, without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light. Of men. Then jumping down to verse 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that comes into the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for Jesus coming into this world. And Lord, we know that he came into a world of darkness, and for the most part, he was rejected. Lord, we thank you that you open our spiritual eyes so that we can see Jesus, the truth, the way, the truth, the life and the light. Lord, may we exalt him today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather and to point people to the true light. Lord, this world is a place of darkness. We see it now with the, with the war and the evil that is reigning. Lord, we, we pray that people would see Jesus, the true light. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. slowly spreading to illumine all the sky comes the Christ into the shadows of a world condemned to die praise the light that shines in darkness gracious day spring after night Christ the gospel truth revealing drawing sinners to seat of darkness, rise and come to the light, rise and come to the light. Like the dawn that follows starlight, Christ fulfills the prophet's word. Ancient promises shine clearly in the person of our Lord, pure the radiance of of men exposing bids us wash our sins away darkened soul behold his glory blinded eyes receive your sight sinner leave your seat of darkness rise and come to the light rise and come to the Stay. 
Let's stand together, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Um, now, I started a series on the pastoral epistles where we went through 1st and 2nd, we went through 1st Timothy, Titus, Philemon, now 2 Timothy. Um, I couldn't have planned in the beginning what we would be facing today. I mean, this was last, early last fall. And so here we come to this passage. I, once you understand that God is sovereignly in how we approach Scripture, the first verse says here, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Do you think we're there? I want to tell you, we're there. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's not my job to be an alarmist, but you want to understand that you have world powers threatening nuclear war. So let me put it this way. I don't know worldwide if we have been in a more dangerous moment since the flood. Did that get your attention? Now let me read. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly or immature women, laden with lusts, led away with, diverse, led with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now as Janus and Jampras withstood Moses, so do also these. Resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, faith, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless us as we look at your word. And Lord, help us to be in this world in which we're mindful of things all around the world, to be mindful of ourselves, to realize that there is a God that sits on the throne and that these things that we read in your word are not fantasy. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So, if you've been a student of Bible prophecy, I mean, and we've taken a look at Bible prophecy, there are certain certain things that characterize the last days. I mean, the Bible, Daniel chapter uh, chapter two through Daniel chapter uh, about chapter seven or so, and then we have you know all kinds of characteristics of the last days. We do know, for instance, one of the things that's going to happen in the last days. There, there is this great tribulation period that is described in the book of Revelation chapter five, Revelation chapter five, four through chapter nine especially chapter 6 through chapter 19, that great tribulation period. One of the great, one of the great personages of those last days is, is a person that we've known as Antichrist. And the, the book of Daniel chapter 9 describes him as one that will rise up, being the people of the prince that will come, a, uh, that Roman Empire, and that he will make a treaty with many, and he's going to make a treaty for seven, seven years, and in the middle of it, he's going to break that treaty. We see that from Daniel chapter 9, and then we see the manifestation of that in the book of, throughout the book of Revelation. And so he's going, to be, he's going to rise in the world scene as a man of peace. He's going to be leading what would be a confederation of nations. It's described several places in the book of Daniel. 
And so it will be a confederation of nations. And we also see some other interesting things in Bible prophecy. For instance, if you go into the book of Ezekiel and you realize in the book of Ezekiel, you have the nation of nations of Gog and Magog. I don't know if you know that, but that's Russia attacking Israel. You have a European confederation attacking Israel. Do you, do you kind of see this kind of stuff? And then there's this great army of 200 million that the Bible describes coming from the east. Who in the world would have thought, I mean, there's no way the Apostle John writing in the first century could have possibly understood the circumstances of our day. Now, I don't know if this is that. I don't know that for sure. But sure is easy sort of to see. In fact, it's kind of like, I mean, if you were, I was just doing, doing some reading recently. Do you know, the prime minister of Israel is the one who is now talking about mediating peace. Did you know that? And it's Israel that has the relationships with both Russia and Ukraine. And by the way, the president of Ukraine is Jewish. It is as if, Tim LaHaye rose from the dead and is writing the headlines. Perilous times. However, these last days, these perilous times, which the Apostle Paul foresaw, and I think this passage is talking about those types of times, don't forget, though, that the description that he is giving us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is for Christians. After all, this is a personal letter. He's writing a personal letter from Paul to Timothy about how Timothy is supposed to be thinking in these last days. So if you would think of it this way, as, as Paul, or God's, personal letter to you about how you should be thinking in the last days, it is helpful for you to apply these things. Now, I want you to notice what it says. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now, the question is, who's he talking about there? Is he talking about all of humanity? Because when we look at this, this passage of Scripture, is this the way, is this a description of all humanity? Now, I think that we could easily go through um, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and see this passage as sort of descriptive of all humanity, but I would say that it is not uniquely descriptive of humanity in the last days. It's typically descriptive of humanity throughout all of human history, unregenerate humanity. What I think is fascinating, and I kind of came to this realization not long ago, Oh, I, I shouldn't say, not many years ago. Not many years ago is a relative term, the older you get. Is that what he is describing here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is not the world out there. It is professing Christianity. And how do you say, how do you know that? Well, because of verse 5, it says, having a form of godliness but denying the power there. And he talks about false teaching in these last days. Now here, so, so let's I, I just get all your attention. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and there, there might be people here who have not, not yet trusted Christ, you have not yet become a Christian. One of the great obstacles sometimes to people becoming Christians is Christians. You see these people that supposedly know Jesus, these people who are supposedly Christians, and they're living like the devil. And that exists in the world. But let me remind you of something. That existed even in the first century. There are false professors of the faith. There is such thing as a fake church and fake Christianity. And what the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy is that it will become even more pronounced in the last days. There is, a, there, there is a fake church. Now, we would think, you would think, if there's a fake church, that that would totally undermine the church altogether, but it doesn't. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And our God can overcome that. But there is such thing as a fake church. And uh, 
for you that are Christians. Let me tell you, do not be discouraged. You say, well, I, I don't know, I've been in the church and I've been serving the Lord, but then I've, I've come across these Christians or these churches in which they don't seem, there seems to be no real Christianity there. I'm just going to throw in the towel and walk away. Walk away from what? Walk away from fake Christianity into no Christianity? What kind of option is that? In fact, this is the point. This is the reason why Paul is writing to Timothy. He's warning him, there is a fake Christianity, but don't let that discourage you. You, look at verse 14, continue in the things that you have learned and been assured of. Don't give up on it because there are fakes. Don't give up on it because there are, there are people who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, claiming Jesus Christ as Savior. Don't, don't give up on it because of those things. And so let me encourage you to remain fast. But there is another There's another lesson for us. Don't be one of them. Don't be a fake Christian. You say, how, how do you be a fake Christian? You walk like it and talk like it and go to church like it and try to be like it, but aren't it. You know, it's, it's all a, it's a sham. It's a shell. It's a show. So let's talk about this fake church, this fake Christianity in the last days. And the Apostle Paul gives um, some description of it. First of all, he says there are dangerous times ahead. Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. There are, there are dangerous times ahead. Now, these are dangerous times for professing Christians. The time approaching is the Great Tribulation. You say, how do we know, you know this, this whole thing of prophecy? Pastor, aren't you reading a lot into Scripture? No, I'm really just taking Scripture what it's, uh, basically at what it says. The book of Daniel, chapter 9, and we have gone over this on Sunday nights and spent some time on it. I can't take the time to lay all of this foundation now, but the Dan Daniel chapter 9 describes a coming day in which God will finish his work that he has planned for Israel. It's Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks, 77s, 490 years, 483 years until Messiah the Prince comes. That's about the time that it took from the time of the, the command to go forth and rebuild Jerusalem until Jesus Christ, was, Jesus Christ came on the scene. That prophecy has already been fulfilled. And then there's this break between the 69th and the 70th. And we know that because of the things that are described. The city's going to be rebuilt. The temple's going to be rebuilt. And the temple's going to be destroyed. The enemy comes in like a flood. All of that, all of that has happened already in that intermediate period. And then there is this event, this singular event that starts the 70th week of the book of Daniel. And that is this antichrist, this great world leader, will rise up in the last days and establish a peace treaty that everybody will love. You say, well, Christians recognize the Antichrist when he comes. Well, hopefully, as far as I understand Scripture, when he truly rises, I won't be here. I'll be raptured out of this place. However, however, I will tell you this. It won't be Putin, okay? You say, why it won't, won't it be Putin? Because it, he is going to be a popular man of peace. And there's no way Putin can get that reputation from here. And so all of these things are happening. They are, these are this last days. And as, so what we're talking about here, though, is these perilous, difficult times as we come toward the end of the age. And as we come toward the end of the age, there will be more of what he describes here. Perilous, difficult, hard times for Christians. By the way, it will be for the world and for the church. How do we know it will be for the world? Well, what we see described in the book of Revelation chapter 6 through 19 is not a pleasant time for the world. I know folks will talk about a pre-wrath rapture, you know, we, you know, there's, I, you know, some people believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, and some people believe in a pre-wrath rapture. I will tell you this, all of it is tribulation, and none of it is what you want to be here for. There will be great difficulties in the first part of that great tribulational period. And so there will be times of difficulty for the world and for the church. By the way, it is inevitable, it is unavoidable. We're not going to change the prophecy of Scripture. It's, a, it's a fascinating. What we need to do is fix this thing, and we're going to solve these problems. Can, can I just tell you, you, you are not going to solve the world problems. Do that which is right. 
pray, ask God, and ask God, maybe there will be a delay in the return of Christ. Maybe this isn't it. All, all, all of those things might come to pass. But here's what I do know. The events of the book of Revelation chapter 6 through 19 will happen one day, and we're not going to stop it. It is crazy, the things that I read. People that seem to long for world war. Now, believe me, you don't want that. There's already discussion about the economic nuclear war that is going on today. Visa and MasterCard announced, was yesterday or this morning, suspending operations, at least with Russia. I, you know, that's a difficult, I, I wouldn't want to be there right now. And all of this is escalating more and more, one against the other, all of that, that going on. I, I will tell you, though, this whole thing, it is inevitable. Why? Because God has declared it. I don't know if this is that, but I, I, I'm not trying to say that. But here is, here's the point for us. With these dangerous times ahead, the danger is truly not in the circumstances in the world, not in famine and not in pestilence and all of that. The great danger here, here it says, is in the people. This know in the last days for men. What's the great danger of the last days? People. And in this particular instance, people in the church. The danger is the people, not the people without, people within. Christianity morphs into an evil, self-absorbed, condition. Is there any doubt that Christianity, it, we, it's interesting, we, we talk about, I, and I, I'm guilty of this, talking about American Christianity. You know, American Christianity, we do, because we tend to be so isolated in our view of ourselves. But, but the fact is that we live in a world and the sins that we see in our culture in the United States are sins that are in the culture around the world. The abortion issue, not only in the, that's not just a, an American sin. That's a worldwide problem. The, uh, the corruption of human sexuality, the destruction of the family, that's a worldwide problem. It's not isolated to this country. You say, well, God's going to judge our nation. No, God's going to judge the world. Because it's a worldwide issue. But the, the thing that is shocking in all of this is that you have a form of Christianity that gives in to this. I was just reading our this last week. The United Methodist Church, and I'm not trying to pick on people, it's just in the news. The United Methodist Church is headed for a complete split. Now, the reason the United Methodist Church is headed for a complete split is over the issue of gay marriage. Because the founding documents of the church uh, forbid it and forbid this as sin, and yet they're practicing it and are ordaining people into church leadership who are in this, and it, it is headed for this split. Why? Because you have this Christianity that morphs into an evil, self-absorbed condition that is willing to accept unholiness as holiness. In fact, the article was saying the, the United Methodist Church is going to split over the issue of holiness. That's the word they used. What are the characteristics of the danger? Here's how Paul described it. First of all, there's self-love instead of a love for God and others. Now, I have broken this list, and it is just this long list. Um, and, and it just kind of flows from one thing to another. I've kind of broke it down into little categories, but the little categories aren't really... It, it's just a way of dividing them up a little bit. So let's talk about self-love. It says, for men shall be what? They're lovers of them themselves. It's all about selfishness. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. And we have seen that in Christianity, where Christianity turns into this religion where people, uh, you know, it's all about, you know, the great person or the great man or the uh, the, the star. Or and, and and so we've we've turned Christianity into an entertainment culture in which we worship leaders in, in Christianity, and that is a dangerous thing. It is not just lovers of their own selves. It's, it's, it's the next one, lovers of money. There's a love of money. The word that's in your old King James Version here is covetous. It's about the bucks. 
It's not just American Christianity, although certainly American Christianity. It is worldwide Christianity and a false form of Christianity that has become a financial industry. It's about making money, which is why you have all these uh, Christian groups, singing groups and bands and things, you know, making all kinds of money. And then you find out, we've seen it in the past six months or so, declaring themselves not even to be Christians. Just, sell, just peddling a certain form of music that they don't even believe to Christians so they can rake in the box. Love of money. You go to Africa. I've been to Africa a couple of different times in Kenya. And um, the health and wealth gospel, the prosperity gospel that seems so popular in the United States, we have shipped that to the third world. And we have sucked people into, into, into a form of Christianity that is based upon greed and not based upon true holiness. It's, you have the love of money, <laughs> boastful. It says, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters. This is, they're speaking boastfully, not only boastful in word, they're proud, arrogant in heart. Just watch. Some of Christianity that you see on the radio, not on the radio, but more even on the TV. Boastful, arrogant, proud, but not just that. There's another one, and this is the idea of ir irreverent blasphemer, blasphemers. It's hard to imagine this from true Christianity because you have people who are claiming the name of Christ and blaspheming the name of Christ. But I'll tell you. I, I never thought I would see it, but I've seen it in the last 10 years. Men who stand in pulpits, supposedly of evangelical churches, using profanity in the pulpit because it relates with the people. Taking God's name in vain in the pulpit. You know, de devout Jews still won't write the name of God out fully. In the, in the articles they write, in secular settings, and yet people who, who claim that Jesus Christ died for their sins, this is one of the Ten Commandments. This is one of the most basic ideas of Christian ethics. It's hard to imagine this of believers. But taking God's name in vain, making him an afterthought. Disobedient to parents. By the way, the reverence here. Dis, disobedient. The, the normal relationships this is, that should exist between children and parents have been thrown, been thrown away. Every culture that survives teaches a respect for its elders. But disobedient, again, characteristic of professing Christianity. Ungrateful to God. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unthankful. <laughs> I am. Um, you go back to Romans chapter 1 and the great condemnation of all of uh, humanity as Paul presents his great trial of mankind from Romans chapter 1 through cha Romans chapter 3. The he says you, you're supposed to see the evidence of God is eternal power and Godhead so that we're without excuse in all of creation that is around us. We're supposed to see all of that. We're supposed to understand that we have life and breath and food to eat and water to drink and we're the ability to communicate and ability to have relationships with one another. And if there's anything that we should do as humanity is at least look to the evidence of a creator and say to the creator, thank you. Disobedient to parents, ungrateful to God and others. Unholy. Unholy. No sense of personal sanctification. It is interesting that when, when God called us to salvation, he didn't call us to a sentimental relationship with Jesus Christ so that we, so that we have Jesus to talk to every day. And, so the, and we talk about this all the time. I, I love these great songs that talk about 
I'm forgiven and there, you, there can be no claim against me before the, the throne of God that I stand uncondemned. I, I love those because I am a sinner, but I have to be careful that I don't take grace and make it some sort of normal characteristic of who I'm supposed to be in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said so in Romans chapter 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, may it never be. Absolutely not. Any man who is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There is supposed to be some sort of transforming work in, in the life of a believer in which we are called to holiness. We're called to be something different. We're not called to the, the lying and the anger and the immorality and the... the, the and all the things that are described here. No sense of being set apart for God. Irreverent. Imagine this of believers. Disobedient to parents, ungrateful to God and others, unholy. This is an interesting, unloving. It says, without natural affection. This is an interesting word that is used here. There are several words that are used uh, to describe love in the Bible. We have the agape love that is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It is that self-sacrificing love. You have in the Greek language the word eros, which speaks of a physical love. We don't see that, that word in the Bible. Uh, there is the, the word phileo, which speaks of an affectionate personal type of love. It's, the, uh, it's, it's used a number of different places in the, the Bible. When Jesus said you know, to Peter beside the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection, he said, you know, Peter, do you love me, agape, me, Peter responded, Lord, you know, phileo, I'm very fond of you. I have great feelings of affection. So that, that, those words are used in Scripture. But this is one that is rarely used in Scripture, but it is used here. It's the word storge. I always remember that. You know, there are certain things that I used to remember my Greek vocabulary when I was going through college. And I always thought of storge as the stork. And so what is, this, what, is this, what is the stork supposed to bring? Brings the babies. Storge love is that natural family love. Storge love is that love that you get when you first set your eyes on that newborn baby. I, I remember that. I remember watching that when Anaya, our first granddaughter, was born. We were in the hospital there, and I remember Christopher, my son, who was leading songs here this morning. I remember watching him look at her for the first time. And it was just like, boom. It's just, it is this automatic love. Now, here's what it's saying. The normal love that parents should have for their children. We already talked about the love that children should have for their parents, on disobedient to parents. But that normal love, that normal care that parents should have for their children is gone. You say, well, pastor, that's still around. Is it really? How about the bumper stickers that say, I'm, spilled, I'm spending my children's inheritance? How about a generation that with no qualms at all seems to be willing to steal from two, three, four generations in the future to, to gain its own prosperity now? How about a generation that is willing to kill its babies in the womb? How about that? How about a generation that is willing to live for itself and sacrifice the responsibility that it is supposed to have in raising its own children? And this is a problem not just in the culture. This is a problem in Christianity without normal familial love. Truce breakers. <laughs> you see, truce breakers. That sounds like something that presidents do. You know, people that break truces, you know, you're supposed to keep the truce. And you're supposed to you're have the ceasefire so you can get everybody out of the city safely. And then somebody breaks the truce. And that, you know, that is just this great... It is interesting. We talk about all of that. In war, there's no sense of real trust. 
But that's not exactly what this is talking about. This is talking about things in normal everyday life. In particular, this is truce breakers in this passage of scripture is a word that idea, the idea is really more the idea of this unwillingness to reconcile. I'm mad. I'm going to be mad. I'm going to hold a grudge. And I'm going to do so because I'm go, I believe I'm righteous about it. And I'm going to do it the rest of my life. And there's nothing you can do about it. That is ungodliness. It's wickedness. Truce breakers. Unwillingness to reconcile. False accusers. False accusers. Oh, you see. Somebody goes in before the court and makes false accusations. No, no, no. This is also malicious gossips. People that start, it is interesting how this all works. We have to be careful about these things. Something's going on. You know it. And then you start to speculate. And once you start to speculate, then you start to assume. And once you assume, you start to believe it as facts. And next thing you know, you're making accusations about people that are not true. And you're destroying people's lives. You're destroying people's reputations. Sometimes doing it innocently simply because you wanted something to talk about. And sometimes doing it purposely because you're purposely trying to hurt someone or help yourself. False accusers. God sees these as horrible things. Without self-control, incontinent, just cannot control themselves. Just cannot control themselves. More here. Brutal, fierce. The idea here is brutal in the way that they treat others. Um, we've seen a lot of brutality. You say, well, yeah, we're seeing it in this war. In Russia and Ukraine and all these things that are going on, we've not just seen it in the war. We've seen brutality in the past years in riots and online. We've seen the brutal and vicious ways in which people have talked about one another and battered one another's reputation, and destroyed one another's lives, and seek to silence people. We have seen brutality on all kinds of levels. Brutal. Despisers of people for their goodness. Despisers of the, I mean, just because they're good, they're wrong. And, and, and this is the world we're in. This is a world in which what is right has now been declared to be wrong, and what is wrong is being declared to be right. And what has been, at least in the United States, professing evangelicalism seems to be succumbing to that. Now, I'm going I'm to say this as kindly as I can. The Bible is not ambiguous about certain sins. Immorality, sexual sin, is clearly declared to be sexual sin. Sexual relationships outside of marriage are clearly to be declared to be unrighteous. In much of professing evangelicalism today, it is discard, dis, dis, accepted as just normal. It's fine. It can be part of church leadership, the worship team, whatever. You can be, no big deal. You can be living with somebody that's not your wife or husband. It's no big deal. And, and now, of course, the Bible clearly defines who those relationships should be with. God created Adam and Eve. One man, one woman is how the Bible defines marriage. Yet, I say that Right now, I say that from this pulpit today, and that's controversial. Even in Christianity, it should never be. It is simply the word of God. Homosexuality is sin. Transsexuality is an aberration from where God made people. Usually it's the result of sin. 
I mean, these, th- these things that are corrupting our culture, and some of these things I think are the part of the judgment of God as God takes back his withholding. But the, these things have to be declared to be good. But why, right now is when you take a position of these, on these things and sometimes simply seek to live a holy life minding your own business, they won't leave you alone. They will not be happy until you say they're okay. They will not be happy, despisers of those that are good. And this is going on in a Christianity. Traitors. This is simply those who turn on those that deserve their loyalty. You know, there's somebody that's done good for you and have been loyal to you and been faithful to you, and you discard them. Like all of that, loyalty means nothing. Heady. Or the idea of heady here is rec- reckless, acting impulsively, acting dangerously, without a sense of the consequences. You know, did you know that that is actually sinful? The Old Testament condemns that. In fact, the Old Testament has specific laws for when somebody acts recklessly or dangerously and and takes the life of or does damage to others. They're held accountable for that. There are sometimes it's not called murder, but it's called manslaughter. Why? Because I have a responsibility and you have a responsibility to think through the consequences of your actions. And you decide you're going to, you know, go blasting through the intersection. You say, well, you know, I'm just taking my life in my own hands. Well, it's your life belongs to God, not you. But second, you're taking the lives of others in your own hands. One example of this would be simply the use of alcohol, like drinking and driving. That would come under the category of reckless, acting impulsively, acting dangerously, putting the lives of others, uh, driving under the influence, which I'm... I think I can make a a good case that there's no good biblical reason to be drinking alcohol. Because it puts you in the... First of all, it it damages your judgment that allows you to act recklessly, that puts the lives of others and the livelihoods of others in danger. You know, Coors. You're you're all familiar with Coors? You You don't live in such a Christian bubble, you don't know about that. Their own documentation says one in, per, one in ten people that start drinking become an alcoholic. Think about that for a moment. You think about recklessness. One in ten. Would you take a revolver that had ten bullets in it, spin it, and put it to your head? Would you, would you consider that reckless? How about you spin it and put it... The, you say, well, but it's just alcoholic. What, what kind of damage does an alcoholic typically do to his wife, to his children, to his family? You mean, those are some things for us to think about when we think about being reckless, high-minded, sense of superiority puffed up, um, um, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, sense of superiority, we're so much better than they are. <laughs> I have an education. So I must be better than everybody else because I have an education. You can't correct me because I have a master's degree. Puffed up. I um, I went to Calvary Seminary in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. The year after I graduated, my pastor, Pastor Singleton, came and preached the graduation. It wasn't my graduation. It was my friend Mike Sproul's graduation. And what you know what he preached? At a seminary graduation, you know what he preached? This is his text, knowledge puffeth up. It does. We need to be careful. Characteristics of the danger, fake in their faith. Here we come. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of. Having the forms, you can can talk about the Bible, but don't accept the Bible as true or authoritative. 
You, you sing the, the hymns, but you don't believe the things that you sing. You come to glorify God, but instead of glorifying God, you glorify man. You, you, you talk about it. Now, there are, I will tell you that there are two different ways that the, in which this can go. Uh, let's talk about the two different ways, ways. There's one, an intellectual faith that has no life. When I was in seminary, of course, that was back when we really had big libraries. They don't have as big libraries anymore because most everything's electronic. I, I don't know what there's maybe 70,000 volumes in the library there at the seminary. Um, and almost all theological orientation. So it was a seminary library. It wasn't a regular library with books on mathematics and you know, all that kind of stuff. It was, it was a seminary library. And I worked as the janitor at the seminary. You say, well, what? it was a humbling job. I had the keys to the library. That was a strategic job. There was a janitor's closet right across the street, right across the, the, the room from the coffee break area for the seminary. It was big. I moved a desk in there, a lamp in there. I moved my, my com computer in there. I had everything set up. I had a bigger office than any of the seminary. But I had the key to that library. I could go to that library and I could study all night if I wanted. And I did. One of the things that was very clear is you're studying, reading the books, look, you know, doing research papers. And I don't know why this is, but when you go to seminary, what they want you to do all the time is just write, 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 write. I mean, they just, it's crazy just how much writing they want you to do. So you're trying to write all these papers, doing the research and all this. One, and what, what became very clear to me that is a, a large number of the writers of the books that were in a seminary library were actually unbelievers. They had an intellectual understanding of the Word of God. But they studied it like it's some sort of book, just textbook. They didn't, sometimes they didn't care whether the words were true or not. It wasn't like they were trying to disprove them or prove them. They were just tr treating them as if they were just some sort of academic exercise. There was no, there was no life. And this is a, this is a really dangerous thing. Sometimes Christianity, we react so much to what we see as an errant emotional Christianity that we end up with a dead intellectual Christianity in which we say, well, you know, God used to do that, but God doesn't do that stuff anymore, and God doesn't do this, and God doesn't do that, and we, and we seek no real blessed presence of God in our lives. We don't see Christianity in today's Christianity as something supernatural where God is really at work and God is transforming the hearts of people and God is active in my heart and, and God is active in the others. Folks, there is intellectual truth in Christianity and we need to be honest with the word of God, but this word of God is powerful. It does stuff. And it does stuff today. It changes people's lives. It changes people's hearts. It transforms people. God is in the miracle working business. And, and God pours out miracles on us that sometimes that we can't even possibly imagine. Last, last summer, we voted as a church to establish um, a, a mortgage debt reduction fund. You know, about the time that we established that, it was 1.6 million or something like that. I don't remember the exact number, somewhere around there last summer. And I'm thinking, well, I think we can do this. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to really trust him to do something miraculous. I think we could get this paid off, you know, in maybe about two years. And I, I just, you know, you just, there wasn't anything rational that said that that could happen, except that we believe in a God that does miracles, right? The God, and I'm, I'm not talking about intervening in the, Providentially, God's blessing. Well, it won't, the, the likelihood is that we're going to have it paid off in less than a year. In other words, he's done more than we can ask or think. God is at work, folks. So we have this, this fake faith, it's intellectual faith without life. But there's also another one, that that's an emotional faith without substance. Now, I'm not going to accuse Northwest Valley Baptist Church of this one, okay? But you know what I'm talking about, where it's all ushy-gushy and 
singing and, you know, and waving. It, you know, where it's just sort of this, it's kind of, it's all there, but it's, there's nothing real underneath. It's, 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 it's a put on kind of fake happiness. Can I tell you that when, when the pressures of persecution come, that kind of faith withers and blows away in the wind? We have to have a faith that is truly, honestly, intellectually, and spiritually grounded in the word that believes that God does miraculous things in this age. But this is a faith fake. It has, a, it has the shell. It looks like it from the outside, but, it's, but there's nothing inside. And the commanded res- response is here. From such turn away. Turn away from it in your Christian entertainment. Turn away from it in your listening habit. Turn away from it in your watching habits. As I, we're going to go out on the radio, we're going to go out on the internet, all of that. If you are in a church that, where this, this is what characterizes the Christianity of your congregation, turn away. You say, Pastor, are you telling people to leave their churches? Yes. The fake ones. Now, I'm not saying that every church would be perfect. There is no such thing, and there are sinners in churches. But he says, listen, turn away from what is described here. Don't claim them as believers. They're corrupt and corruptors. He says, notice, he says, turn away. Well, why, why, why should you do this? Why should you turn away? He says, verse 6, for this, they which creep into houses, they lead another, they're always creeping in. I think it's interesting. He says, they creep into houses. They come into your house. They come into your car. They come on, on the media. They come on your phone, right? They come in on YouTube. They come in on, on the internet. There are false, I'll call them false Baptists that are out there. Little tiny churches, but followings on the internet that are, you know, like on YouTube, they're worldwide. And it's a fake ungodly, unloving Christianity. I mean, they're creeping into the houses and, they, and they're corrupting others. It says when it says they lead captive silly women, this isn't, this isn't describing all women as silly. Okay, that is not what this is doing. The, that word silly is actually the idea of immature. So, you know, the, the wife is at home but the husband is out working. There's this immature wife and they're coming in by the back door. Instead of coming in through the front door, instead of, instead of dealing with the family straight in, they're coming in through the back door just like Satan did in the garden with Eve. Laden with sins. I think it's describing, uh, describing them. Led away with diverse, speaking of these people, led away with diverse lusts. Let's, it says, turn away, they're depraved. They oppose the truth. Notice what they're ever learning, but never able to come to the top. It's all about intellectual. I'm going to go to the next conference, go to the next thing, I'm going to hear the next person, let's hear the next speaker. Can I just tell you, I mean, I think I, you're, I'm a preacher. I mean, here I am standing in the pulpit. I'm doing it right now. I'm, you know, I've spent my, my week preparing Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. You know, I, you spend time, you know, right? I, I'm doing all of this. But it seems like people sometimes have this insatiable appetite for more and more, hearing more and more, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to hear more, especially that appetite that comes from that, that initial faith in Christ. You know what I'm talking about? You first get saved, you just want to take in everything you can take in. But I'm talking about the, you know, the folks that become the sermon connoisseurs, and they're going to, the, you know, going to this conference, it'll give me the exciting stuff about this and that, and we're, we're really, but they're not really interested in being a Christian. They're not really interested in living it out in their life or sharing it with their neighbor. They're ever learning and never able to come to the 
the knowledge of truth. And he describes them, the Janus and Jabbers, they withstood Moses. They were opposed to the truth. They were opposed to true spiritual leaders. So they do these, these also resist the truth. They're men of what? They're corrupt minds. They're reprobate concerning the faith. They're in the faith, but they're damaging the faith. The point of being in there is to damage. They're like spies. They're like soldiers in the wrong uniform. But they shall proceed no further. Their folly shall be revealed unto all men as theirs also was. It won't last forever. It won't last forever. The commander response, turn away, always means turning something. So if I'm going to turn away from false teaching, I have to turn away to something. Now, what am I supposed to turn away toward? Well, you're supposed to turn away toward Jesus. But you also turn toward genuine believers. You've known me. And this is where we're going to pick up next week. We're going to talk about the influence. You have this false faith, but then you have the true faith. And don't forget, for every, <laughs> there are false believers out there, but there are also true ones. And don't take your eyes off the true one. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we remember that there are true toward genuine believers, toward the things that you know to be true. Be faithful in the last days.